research experiment, or CDMS. Following uh, his completion of the degree, he joined NIST as a NRC postdoc, uh, where he conducted research on advanced applications of superconducting uh, TS-based detectors. Uh, which has applications including development of high energy resolution X-ray uh, detector systems, which has since been commercialized and uh, uh, developed for advanced detector readout schemes that will be used in the next uh, generation of ground-based submillimeter telescopes or SCUBA. Uh, he was hired full time uh, at NEST uh, since 2001 and continued this and other advanced metrology work there. Uh, he's been involved both at Stanford and NIST with the first demonstration of TES sensors to directly detect optical photons and demonstrated the first use of TES optical photon sensors for astronomical observations and the first use of TES detectors for photon number resolving detectors, uh, detection in weak pulses of light at telecommunication optical wavelengths. Uh, recently, he has participated in development of superconducting qubit based large area Josephson junctions. Dr. Sewu Nam received 2002. Uh, Picasso Award for his work on advanced photodetectors and contributions to the field of primarily or uh, primary thermometry using Johnson noise. So with that introduction, I would like to invite Dr. Nam to the podium. And he'll be talking to us about single photon detection using superconductors, progress to promise. All right. Thanks, Amit. Uh, yeah, that, uh, well, thanks for the invitation to come down. I'm really actually happy to have the opportunity to speak with uh, uh, in front of a younger audience than normal uh, students um, because it well I view this as a recruiting uh, trip so to speak and try to convince you maybe when you're done to think about coming up to, to Colorado and and doing a postdoc if you're interested at NIST um, and uh, certainly it's good to be here because there's a lot of interesting optics work uh, that uh, well, I wouldn't normally get to see the details of uh, if I were to just stay at NIST in Boulder. Anyway, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is a little bit different than what Amit talked about in my bio. Um, if you actually, I don't know what, I've never Googled myself, but I suspect if you Googled, Googled my name, um, you might see a lot of work on something known as a transition head sensor. And it's a different kind of superconducting detector than what I'll talk about today. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, some work uh, that's really taken off in the last uh, five years or so uh, based on nanowire superconducting single photon detectors. And I'll kind of tell you where it started from, what we've done recently, and where I think there's some interesting things that uh, could happen in the future. Uh, and this is just an example. So what's fantastic about working at NIST, if you're a device person, if you really like getting in the lab, and, and making stuff is we actually have a class 100 clean room that's kind of dedicated to superconducting electronics. And so this is a 75 millimeter wafer blown up into a huge size on this screen. And each one of these lollipop shaped uh, uh, devices is actually a photo detector chip that we we fabricate in our clean room. And at the center of that disc is a is a really very sensitive single photon detector. And Hopefully later in the talk you'll see why it's made in this funny shape. All right, so um, I've, uh, I've amazingly gotten quite old, and there are a lot of people that actually work with me or work for me technically uh, at NIST. I have a lot of uh, postdocs and guest researchers and, and other uh, NIST staff member who, uh, whose work you'll see here. Uh, a lot of people go on and do other better things now after they leave our project. Uh, and then a lot of the work is done in very close collaboration with folks from the Jet Propulsion Lab Laboratory. Um, uh, one of my former postdocs, Francesco Marsili, is really, uh, really, really a smart guy. And uh, we, we continue to work together. So although uh, today I'm going to talk to you about single photon detectors, uh, actually my group is known as the Faint Photonics Group. And I work closely with Rich Mirren, who's the group leader for, in quantum nanophotonics. And, Together, we've kind of merged our groups, and we really are trying to really understand how uh, measurements at the few photon or faint photon levels can be applied in, uh, into maybe potentially real-world applications. Um, so we have a lot of research areas, not only in detection, but also creating interesting uh, single photon sources or maybe exotic quantum states 
of light as well as then using those states of light and the detectors to do some interesting measurement. Uh, we have collaborators around the world, uh, all over the place, uh, and we get a lot of funding from uh, DARPA and the intelligence community uh, to develop these detectors. And uh, I think you'll see that they are extremely sensitive, and so there's a lot of interest uh, if you want to see every photon of, uh, to use our detectors. All right, so here's a brief outline of what I'm going to try to talk about. Uh, it's, we have a small enough group here that if you feel like or you're, am, uh, you're brave enough, feel free to interrupt me and I'll answer your question right away if you have a question because uh, I don't want to lose anyone if I can in terms of following the kind of work we're doing. Um, so I'll start with why, you know, why is NIST interested in, in, at, uh, let's say, faint photonics. I'll kind of describe where things were with these nanowire detectors and some interesting demonstrations that we did. Uh, I'll highlight some of our more recent developments. Uh, and then I'll talk about some future directions that things could move in, move towards. All right, so really um, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, really is about really advancing measurement sci uh, science and technology for the benefit of society. And if you really want to measure everything as precisely as you can, you're going to want to measure down to the in individual quanta. So there are a lot of programs, or there's a variety of programs at NIST trying to measure different uh, single quanta. So, you know, one of the most obvious things you can think about is, you know, counting single electrons and maybe if you count the single electrons at a fast enough rate that could lead to a current standard, like a standard for the amp. Um, single flux quanta, I don't know how many of you uh, know, but the magnetic field is quantized in something known as a flux quanta. And actually the rate at which flux quanta flows, uh, that's d phi dt, is actually voltage and actually the, the in the in the world today, we realize the SI, the, the system of units voltage, by, by uh, counting flux quanta at a particular rate. Uh, there's a lot of work on single atoms and single ions. Dave Wineland recently won the Nobel Prize. He's at, he's at NIST in Boulder uh, looking at single trapped ions. And then my group and uh, several other groups at NIST are in, interested at single photons. And really, uh, we're interested in single photons because it's the fundamental unit of measure for light. You know, it's the, you can't break break down light any further than that. Uh, and we want to understand whether we can make, in some sense, a toolbox where we can not only generate these, you know, single photons, hopefully even on demand, uh, manipulate them, and then measure them. And if we can do all those things, we think there's some really interesting uh, things you can do in terms of quantum information science and technology, metrology. And even maybe, you know, 10, 15 years from now, think about redefining the way optical power metrology is done. So instead of, do, uh, hopefully I'll get to it at the end, but instead of doing more conventional radiometry to measure optical power, actually just count all the photons in the, in the light field. And that would tell you how much power uh, is flowing in the light field. All right. So uh, my talk really today is really focused around single photon detectors. And one of the things to remember about single photon detectors is that they come in all kinds of varieties. And when you're thinking about um, using a single photon detector or an application with a single photon detector, uh, there's some really important metrics. And I've just listed a few here that are important to consider. Um, one is, you know, what wavelength are you interested in uh, looking or measuring? Uh, if you're uh, putting a system together, maybe a communication system, uh, you're going to want to understand what the detection efficiency is, like how, how much light do I actually need to have before I'll start to see a signal? You know, am I going to see 10% of my photons, 90% of my photons? Uh, it's useful to know that quantity if you're doing an experiment and you can only see 1% of your photons, it's going to take you a long time to finish your experiment because you're missing 99 of them out of 100. Uh, the other thing that's important is to understand uh, something known as a dark count rate uh, versus a background count. So typically, you know, to detect a single photon, your amplifier system or whatever you're going to use uh, re requires a lot of gain. And sometimes noise uh, could be mistaken as a photon. And so that's known as a, a dark count or a false, false positive or false, false click. But at the same time, if you don't do a good job shielding your experiment or your, your optical system, stray background light will come in and that will cause your detector to click. So it's not really a, a dark count. It's actually a, a, a click due to background light leaking into your system. Uh, so uh, these two things are important to know about your single photon detector, its dark count rate, and maybe its susceptibility to background. Uh, another thing if you're, for example, in a communication scenario is to really understand the timing jitter. 
uh, when, when did the photon arrive? What's the uncertainty in that, that number? And that's known as the jitter. And then a lot of times you want to know how fast can I count? I'm going to count these photons. Uh, a lot of times there, there may be a physical limitation due to the device itself that it can't count faster than a certain rate. And that's known as the, the maximum count rate. So these are more uh, technical specs that, you know, if, if, you're, um, if you're just doing calculations on how, how good your system or experiment will be, uh, you put all those numbers together and you can, you can, in some sense, make an estimate of how well your system or experiment will work. Uh, but other, exper other considerations one should think about, and I put in here, quote, risk, um, is uh, if you're going to take on a technology that's not commercialized or, you know, so the, all the stuff that you'll hear from me is not really commercially available technology. We're certainly willing to collaborate with people and, and figure out whether we can get something to people to use, but um, there's a lot of risk in using these non-commercial things, and that really comes down to understanding uh, how it's actually packaged. You know, does it take... Uh, does it take a whole classroom of equipment to get this single little single photon detector to work? Or is it, you know, some little thing that's the size of your iPad or iPhone and that's, that's the size of the photo detector completely packaged? That's, these are things to think about when you actually want to build it, build your system. Uh, you know, how, how is the light delivered to the detector? How big is the detector system itself? And in our case, one of the big things you should be aware of is that the operating temperature is not necessarily room temperature. All right, and one thing I want to emphasize is, you know, the whole reason I got into this field was it turned out there was a particular measurement challenge, and that was having good detectors that work at 15, 15 nanometers. So what, I'll, what I was going to talk about briefly, and hopefully I don't spend too much time on this slide, is, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is kind of dated. It's from 2011. This is kind of a summary of what's available if you just want to buy something off the shelf, just commercially available. There are... Uh, there are some PMTs were the first kind of devices that were commercially available that one could buy to detect light. Uh, but then pretty quickly, uh, semiconducting versions of uh, detectors came onto the market. And these are what most people today will, will probably purchase and use. And what, what you'll notice is that if you're interested at detecting light at 15, 15 nanometers, and that's of interest to the telecommunication community, uh, you'll see that here that the dark count rate for those kinds of detectors is quite high. You get a lot of false positives. And if you want to use the, uh, the commercially available semiconducting version, it can't count very fast. It's got about a 10 kilohertz staring uh, count rate. Uh, anyway, so my group really, what we've been un trying to understand is how do you, how can you use superconductivity or superconducting devices to maybe address this, this problem of detecting light in the 15, 15 nanometer wavelength band, but it turns out superconductors work very well from the UV down to the mid-IR. Uh, we've been working on several technologies. Uh, the transition head sensor, which is what Amit referred to in my bio, uh, is maybe the older technology, but more recently we've been focusing on these nanowire detectors, and in particular nanowire detectors made out of tungsten silicide uh, alloy. And I'll describe how all that works shortly, uh, but what's really amazing about this thing is that you can get it to be very efficient, extremely low dark count, low jitter, and, and pretty high count rates. Uh, and now, because of some of the advances we've made, there are a couple uh, startup companies trying to actually commercialize the technology we've, we've developed. All right, so these devices that I'm going to talk about today are based on superconductivity. Uh, just as a primer, you don't have to know very much about superconductivity to understand how these devices work. There's just a few concepts you need to know. Uh, one is the concept of a, a transition temperature. So below some kind of temperature, in this case, this is a very low temperature superconductor. It has a superconducting transition temperature at 96 millikelvin, which means it has zero resistance below 96 millikelvin and some kind of finite resistance above. <clears throat> this is the kind of thing we would make a transition head sensor out of. Today, the kind of superconductor I'll talk about is a three kelvin superconductor. So if it's uh, below 3 Kelvin, it superconducts. If it's above 3 Kelvin, it, it, uh, it's a resistive uh, metal. Uh, still quite cold. Um, one of the things to know about superconductors is that, yes, they have zero resistance, but they can sustain uh, a maximum critical current density. You cannot, the critical current density has to be below something known as JC. If you exceed this critical current density, then it will become resistive. So that's an important concept to remember when I try to explain how these devices work. 
So the story in terms of these nanowire superconducting detectors really begins, well, one could argue whether when it actually begins. It may, some people believe it begins earlier, but the first device that was demonstrated, you know, there's theory papers and then there's actually someone getting it to work in the lab. That first device, that happened in 2001. Uh, probably a little earlier than 2001, but it was reported in, in APL in 2001 by a group led by Gregory Goldsmith at the Moscow State Pedagogical University in collaboration with Roman Sobolewski at the University of Rochester. And this detector really is a, is in some sense a digital detector. You know, if, if there's one or more photon absorbed uh, and it's absorbed in the right way, it will cause a click. It doesn't tell you anything about the number. It actually could have been two photons were absorbed and it caused a click. So one thing to remember with this kind of detector is I usually call it a click detector, is that you only know that there was maybe one or more photon that was absorbed. All right, so 2001, interesting paper on uh, using nanowires to, uh, to detect photons. And so how does, this, how does this work? So what you end up doing is you have a, a, a superconductor, a really thin superconductor and a narrow superconductor with current flowing through it. And when a photon comes in, uh, it creates a hot spot where it suppresses the superconductivity. So here, um, this is in some sense the readout circuit. I've drawn the superconductor here as this, as this inductor. It turns out superconductors of the type used in uh, nanowire detectors have this very large inductance, or it's known as kinetic inductance. So I've drawn this detector here as a large inductor. Uh, and most of the current with the current bias is flowing through the superconductor because there's no resistance versus, uh, let's say, the load resistance of your amplifier that's going to be used to read out the signal. So, okay, the photon comes in, creates a hot spot, suppressing the superconductivity. And what then happens is because you suppress the superconductivity, uh, you've exceeded the critical current density that's allowed uh, to flow, and you create this normal region. And so very little, so the current that's flowing through it uh, goes down significantly and more of the current that was provided by this current bias goes into your resistive load or your amplifier that's going to read out the signal. So a normal domain is created and it, it expands and then eventually um, it expands enough away uh, that everything cools off uh, and this current slowly builds back up. So you get more and more current flowing through so it's again back to this the state, the wires back into the state before the photon arrived. All right. <clears throat> So that's how the that's how the physics is. It's it's uh, it's a wire. You break the superconductivity with the photon if you're lucky, and uh, the current flows to the amplifier that's going to read out the signal. Uh, the current builds back up, or the recovery of the current into the nanowire detector is given by the L over R rise time. So I don't know. I'm sure all of you took E and M at this point probably. Uh, and if you did a little circuit theory, the recovery time in terms of building up current in inductor is literally given by when you solve the differential equations is the L over R, R rise time. All right, so <clears throat> this is what this looked like back in 2001. Uh, it's, not, it's not a very big device in 2001. It's just this meander. It's, it was made of niobium nitride. The width of the nanowire was around 80 nanometers. It's only 5 nanometers thick. Uh, and it was grown on a sapphire substrate, so a very specialized substrate. And then using E-beam lithography patterned into this uh, winding wire. But what was fantastic about this device uh, was that it was, had extremely low jitter, sub 50 picosecond jitter. So you, when the photon hit, you got a signal with very low timing uncertainty as to when it uh, arrived. It recovered very quickly, so you could see another photon very soon afterwards. Uh, unfortunately, its detection efficiency typically ranged on the single digit range, so that's not so great. But it had a pretty low dark count rate. It wasn't 10, 100 kilohertz like the commercially available detectors at 1550 nanometers. Uh, it didn't have something known as after pulsing, which is a, something that's symptomatic of uh, semiconductor detectors, which you don't want. Uh, and it could, uh, sorry, that, that's a typo, um, it had a broad range of wavelength sensitivity, anywhere from UV to mid IR. So one of the things, you know, when this came out, uh, people really liked all these performance metrics, uh, but people really didn't know how to take this technology that was developed by people in Moscow and, and Rochester and turn it into a system where if you're an optical scientist or a, a photonics person, um, 
you know, you could just turn a button and get it to work for you. And so in 2003, DARPA gave us some funds to really package this kind of detector with a mechanical cryocooler so that literally, so this is the, this, uh, this little instrument here cools down to around two Kelvin and you can then package that, this cryocooler, this cools to two Kelvin and this is the compressor. So this, this is basically like your refrigerator at home except in, instead of using Freon or Neon or whatever the refrigerant is in our home refrigerators, it uses helium gas. And with that same kind of cooling cycle, compression and expansion cooling cycle, you can cool up to about two Kelvin. And, and we packaged everything in a way into this telecommunication rack. Uh, so you can have eight detectors in a small little cryostat uh, that could be wheeled around to your optics experiment. It's all fiber coupled though. That, that's, uh, that's one thing I didn't, you can't really see very well here. Uh, and so that was interesting and, and what's, what's actually great about this detector and uh, why people were interested in using it at the time uh, was that if you compared it, so for those of you who do uh, time correlated single photon counting, you may recognize this term, this instrument response function. And in some ways it's a measurement of the jitter. And if you look at conventional technologies like silicon, uh, and if you're doing like let's say fluorescent lifetime imaging or some kind of uh, similar photon counting uh, experiment, you'll know that your, your uh, detector system uh, doesn't have a perfect, let's say, delta function response in terms of timing when the photon arrives. It has, well, if you're lucky, it's Gaussian, but in fact, in reality, in all these semiconductor devices, the jitter is not Gaussian. So you have to deconvolve this funny shape out of all your data if you're trying to look at the timing of a, a certain physical process. And if you use a nanowire detector, which is in red, uh, the instrument response is Gaussian. It's very easy to deconvolve what your actual true process is doing when the, the instrumentation has a Gaussian response. Uh, so people are really interested in using this to, let's say, characterize fast uh, optical processes in, in semiconductor materials or characterizing single photon sources. And one of the things we did pretty quickly after building our system uh, was we did something known as quantum key distribution where um, you have two parties, Alice and Bob, and uh, they want to do, they want to exchange some information uh, in a secure way. And you can't do that uh, unless they each have a key and you need a way to distribute that key. Of course, the, Alice and Bob could agree to meet somewhere for coffee or beer or whatever and, and exchange key material that way. But if they can't and they're two, they're separated from each other, then you need a way for key distribution. And, and there's a way using quantum mechanics and the right kinds of quantum states of light for Alice and Bob to actually generate key material that they both know and no one else knows. And it relies on the fact that the security really relies on the facts that uh, if there's an eavesdropper trying to get information from the transmission between Alice and Bob, it introduces error in the communication link. And that eavesdrop detection, so to speak, is the way you bound the kind of information that the eavesdropper got, and that's how you can guarantee security. So if you want to do this with photons, the serious thing that limits you in terms of how fast you can generate key and exchange key is the, how fast the click rate, as well as the jitter, because if you are trying to create key material, you want to try as many times as possible per second. So you want really low jitter devices so you can try a lot of times per second. Uh, but you don't, want any, you, don't want any, you don't want any false positives or dark counts from your detector because the eavesdropper, that has to be attributed potentially to an eavesdropper hacking into your system. Uh, so dark counts and jitter really limit how, how, um, how securely you can communicate, how far you can communicate, and, and at what rate you can communicate. And so with our system that we built with, uh, with the DARPA funds, uh, we did an experiment, uh, these, these things, I don't really want to go into the details of this experiment, but what the key thing here is that we did this key generation at 10 gigahertz. This was, you know, this is the kind of standard telecommunication clock rate you'll see in terms of a conventional telecommunication uh, system. It's, it might be running at 10 gigahertz. Certainly in, in 2007, that was the case. Now, maybe it's 160, maybe it's 100, maybe it's 40 gigabits, but at the time, 10 gigahertz was pretty standard and, and no other, you know, no other technology at the time, single photon, and no other technology since really can count at this high rate in this kind of high clock rate system. And uh, we set a lot of distance records in terms of how far we could communicate, secure key distribution, uh, and things like that. So that was a pretty big paper that uh, raised a lot of eyebrows in terms of 
people understanding that even though these detectors maybe had one or two det percent detection efficiency, the timing jitter and the maximum count rate were so good that you could think about using it in uh, interesting communication systems. And so it actually, what ended up happening, uh, maybe uh, five or six years later, is that NASA uh, did something known as a lo the Lunar Laser Communication Demo. And I don't know if there are people here who worked on that project, uh, but there was a, a satellite sent to the moon, LADEE, L-A-D-E-E. -E. And it had a science mission to understand um, like the dust in the, in the moon's atmosphere. But it also had a technology demonstration component at the end of the science mission. And that was to demonstrate uh, optical communications or laser-based optical communications. And it, for this demonstration, uh, the detectors that they used were these nanowire detectors for this demonstration. Because they're very sensitive, low dark counts, and high timing resolution. And with that, they were able to demonstrate from the moon to the Earth a laser comm link. It's the longest laser comm link that's been demonstrated of 400,000 kilometers. It was able to download. So the receiver station on the ground, which had the nanowire detectors, um, was able to download data at 622 megabits per second. I mean, the funny story, and I don't remember the details, was there wasn't 722 megabits of data on the satellite. I mean, it had the science mission. Uh, but it didn't connect, collect that much data. So they just kept sending the same data over and over and over. But basically, at a high enough rate, you could watch HD video from the moon. Um, and it used basically 16 nanowire detectors. They were fabricated at MIT Lincoln Labs. And MIT Lincoln Labs was responsible uh, for the, one of the ground stations and actually you know, closing the link with the satellite and, and uh, demonstrating it's possible to make a high-speed uh, optical comm link from a satellite. And there's some thought within NASA that in the future for really long distance uh, communications that optical photons are the right way to go. And if you're going to be commu uh, communicating over, let's say, planetary length scales, you're going to need the most sensitive single photon detector you can, you can find to do, to do that kind of communication. All right, so those, these are things that have you know, kind of happened in the past. What I'm going to try to focus on for a little bit of time is uh, some of the interesting things that we did at NIST in terms of detector development. Uh, I'm going to talk about some new materials and how that really, I would say, changed the, changed the landscape of, of why these kinds of detectors or how these detectors could be more useful. And then I'm going to start talking about uh, how this new material enabled us to make small arrays. So if you recall, uh, the first demonstrations of, the, of this kind of uh, detector technology involved this material known as niobium nitride. Uh, and um, what's tricky about fabricating a device out of niobium nitride is that it needs to be fabricated under very, very specialized conditions. Uh, like the substrate needs to be 800 degrees Celsius. Uh, the target, uh, the target needs to be ultra, ultra pure. The atmosphere that you sputter in needs, to, you know, there are all kinds of uh, difficult conditions uh, for fabricating this kind of material on on the sapphire substrate. And so I had a really uh, a good postdoc working with me, and one of the things we talked about would be, wow, you know, they have to do all this trouble uh, to make sure they get this high quality polycrystalline film on the sapphire substrate to make these nanowires. And one of the problems was that uh, the quality of the, the nanowire would be such that um, you'd have huge variation in the performance of devices fabricated in the same run. Because it was ne never clear that you could pattern or fabricate such thin films and pattern to such narrow wires uh, a polycrystalline material well. So one of the things I was advocating was, well, why don't we try to find an amorphous material where you don't really care about the the crystallinity and getting the right polycrystalline combination of crystal phases. Uh, and so this postdoc that I had went and did that. He, uh, he fabricated some films out of tungsten silicide. And what we found was it, it, uh, it worked amazingly well. We did not have to fabricate with a sophisticated lithography uh, 80 nanometer wire. We could you know make it 150 nanometers wide so it's easier to make. Uh, it's roughly the same thickness, but it's amorphous, and we could do it on silicon. So the fabrication was tremendously easier. 
Uh, and what I would say, and I'll show you that this really led to higher internal efficiency. So the probability that a, if a photon's absorbed, you get a click from the device, that went up. Uh, we make lar much larger area devices. What I showed you initially in those first few view graphs about the technology in 2001 was the dimension of that detector was like two microns by two microns. And you're trying to detect a photon, which is one and a half microns. So getting light focused down to that area is really, really hard. And it's, you know, triply, quadruply hard if you're trying to do it at, at cryogenic temperatures. Uh, so we, make, we can make large devices, and that makes it much easier to couple to fiber. Uh, the larger width and the amorphous gives us better yield, but there's a cost, and the cost is that the operating temperature actually is colder. It's, it's not four Kelvin, it's now one Kelvin. But, uh, you know, my, under, my graduate school work was about running at 50 millikelvin, so one Kelvin is relatively hot compared to 50 millikelvin. So to me, that wasn't a big deal, but to a lot of other people, it, it is a, it's a challenge. But um, that challenge actually has been solved, but I don't have time to talk about it, but it, it's been solved. All right, so the conventional technology, and, and still people use this technology of niobium nitride, was that when, when a photon was created, you get this hot spot, uh, current would go around the hot spot. And if you were unlucky, uh, you would never see a click because you wouldn't ex the the current could go around the the uh, the heated area and not break the superconductivity. And so what you would see as you increase the current bias in the device that the detection efficiency would go up and up and up and up. And it seemed like if you could bias any higher or higher than the critical current, you'd even have higher detection efficiency. But you can't bias beyond the critical current. And so you, if you plotted the efficiency like versus current. It seemed to rise indefinitely. What we saw when we made our tungsten silicide devices is as you increase the current bias, it would go up and up and up, and then plateau. It would stop going up. You'd hit some saturation. And to us, that was an incredibly good sign that uh, you reached the maximum possible detection efficiency. You know that there's no point in biasing in higher, any higher in current. And we did that for a bunch of different temperatures. And the coldest temperature we tested at was 170 millikelvin. The warmest we did in this paper was 1.6. And you still have a plateau where you can bias and still have saturated internal detection efficiency. So that was one good thing. The other great thing was that we could make really large meanders now. Uh, because there wasn't as, as big a constraint on the quality of the fabrication in terms of having to make 80 nanometer wide wires, we could make 160 nanometer wide wires. We could make a meander that was really big and actually then make a meander that filled, let's say, the mode field diameter of an optical beam leaving from an optical fiber. So then we could capture, let's say, all the light. So that was, that was another great thing. And so this leads me to wh uh, why we make uh, detector chips the way we make detector chips. And that is we want to collect as much of the light as possible uh, from the tip of an optical fiber. And so if you take apart a, an optical fiber connector, what you'll find is the optical fiber, uh, a little stainless steel sleeve, and then a zirconia fiber ferrule. And if you've taken apart an a optical fiber to optical fiber, fiber or interconnect, what you find inside that little optical fiber combiner is a zirconia sleeve. And what that zirconia sleeve does is it aligns, let's say, two optical fibers to each other within half a micron. Uh, and if you don't align these two optical fibers to within a half micron when you, when you use an optical fiber jumper cable, you're not going to get very good transmission of light. So using one of these sleeves that you find in one of these conventional FC-FC connectors, um, we basically fabricate our chip so it could slide perfectly inside this zirconia sleeve. So we have a, a sapphire rod, which is also 2.499 millimeters. We put our detector chip, which is 2.499 millimeters in diameter. You slide the zirconia sleeve, and then you can just slide your fiber, and it'll be directly pointed precisely within a half micron to our, our uh, detector area. So we can capture all the light that's coming out of the tip of that fiber. Uh, and so that's how big the whole package looks. All right, and then the other thing we can do now that we're on silicon, we can take advantage of all kinds of standard silicon microfabrication techniques. Uh, we can make our device, instead of making our device directly on, say, silicon oxide, and so when light comes in, a lot goes through, a lot gets reflected, and a little bit gets absorbed, we can put in a mirror underneath our uh, superconducting layer so that if the light goes through the device, it can reflect and get another pass and get a 
potentially absorbed, as well as we can put in some sense an AR coating on top. So you really can kind of try, attempt to trap the light uh, in, the, in the absorptive superconducting layer. And when we did that uh, a few years ago, uh, we got some really high detection efficiency. So this is actually uh, world record results. No one's done any better since then of uh, how efficiently we were able to see photons uh, for the optimal polarization. So if you think about it, we have this meander going back and forth. It's going to be polarization sensitive. So it's more sensitive this way than this way. And that's what you're seeing, the contrast right here between the blue and the red curves is 93% of the photons that are oriented this way with respect to the meander get absorbed and, and only 80% get absorbed if it's perpendicular. Uh, so this is, uh, this, is actually, this actually really excited us and this paper gets quoted quite a bit these days. The other thing that uh, happened was, it turns out these devices are, have much lower uh, device dark count rate, where if the device is in a black box by itself, as a function of the current bias, it very rarely uh, has a false click or false positive. Maybe one, once every 10 seconds it will falsely fire, just from some kind of noise. It turns out when you actually fiber couple to it, you see something like 1,000 counts per second. And that's because the optical fiber uh, and anything that it's seeing at room temperature actually has a black body emission. So you know, just us here living at 300 Kelvin, Normally, when we think about uh, black body radiation, we think about night vision goggles and things like that. Uh, the peak of the uh, wavelengths that are being emitted is around 10 microns. But there's a tail out to one and a half and, and longer uh, wavelengths. I'm uh, sorry, yeah. So 10 microns is peaked, it drops, and it's dropping quickly when it gets, gets out to one and a half microns, but there is a non-negligible amount. And that's what our, that's what our detector sees, is the black body radiation because the tip of the fiber is at room temperature. And whenever you want to look at something, you're at room temperature, you're going to see black body radiation. So this is the background, in some sense, limit, count rate limit. So I mean, that, that amazing kind of uh, detector performance actually enables some interesting experiments. And uh, in the last couple months, we reported an experiment uh, doing quantum teleportation. And it was a lot of social media stuff going on. Uh, we have, fortunately at NIST, we actually have someone who does, uh, uh, makes these nice little uh, JPEGs or uh, graphics to explain our experiment in this teleportation. Uh, and it somehow it caught the eye of a lot of people, including George Dekai, and he tweeted about our experiment. So we got some interesting uh, social media reaction and everyone at NIST is quite excited about that happening. But uh, it was all enabled by are good detectors. So I kind of want to stop talking about the single pixel readout and single pixel detector and talk about how, um, you know, great single pixels, what would be gr fascinating and I think uh, an interesting next step is, can you make arrays? And actually what I should say is, um, I didn't actually think about arrays until I uh, actually was talking with uh, Professor uh, Neifeld when he was in, in Washington, D.C. for a while. And he, he, he actually called me kind of out of the blue and wanted to talk to me about uh, making a detector array for one of the programs he was running. And um, I went away for a week, thought about what he wanted, and uh, I invented this new scheme, or this what you'll see is this new way of reading out arrays of nanowire detectors to try to solve some of the problems that he was interested in. So to talk about arrays, let's just revisit uh, how uh, a single pixel readout work, works. So normally what you have is uh, some kind of current bias. You're biasing the, the superconductor or the superconducting pixel with some amount of current below the critical current. So it's superconducting. So all the current is flowing through these, this meander. And then when a photon is absorbed somewhere in the device, it breaks the superconductivity and the current that was flowing through the device gets diverted. And we capacitively divert that current to an amplifier with a 50 ohm uh, input impedance. So the current that was going through the device gets diverted to this amplifier. And that's the signal that you see from the single photon detector. And the nice thing about this, which I didn't mention before and I'll try to mention now, is that this is really just an amplifier that you can find in your cell phone. You can go on to an electronics 
uh, supply place and it costs maybe 25 cents, 50 cents, it's really cheap. So this is a really simple circuit to bias this detector and the electronics to read it out is, is it's more expensive to pay for the shipping of the, the amplifier than it is for the amplifier itself. Um, so this is how a single pixel readout works. And so what you can think about is trying to put a bunch of these in parallel. So here are a bunch of nanowire detectors that I've drawn schematically in parallel and currents flowing through all of them simultaneously. If I have good fabrication techniques, these will not only be pretty identical, and if one of the pixels absorbs a photon and its superconductivity is broken, if I engineer things well, I can get most of the current to go to the amplifier and the input impedance of that amplifier, and maybe a little current leaks to the other pixels themselves, these other pixels. And one could be even a little more clever and say, well, I really want to reduce this leakage current that, it, that leaks to these other pixels. I introduce, introduce an inductor into the, each of these arms, each of these single pixel readouts, so to speak, arms, and it'll, it'll reduce the size of that leakage current so more of this initial current will go to the amplifier. So that, that this is one way to try to reduce the wire count. So now I've got one wire reading out, let's say, five detectors. All right. So then you can take this a step, well, all right, so let's take a step back. Oh, do I have this out of order? Ah, oh, all right, I have it out of order. Okay, so now, now let's do something a little bit tricky. And what we're going to do is not only have all these signals, um, oh, sorry, that are going to flow. Ah, this, I should have, shouldn't have stole this from my postdoc. Should have kept mine. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same trick right here that I'm doing up here. I'm going to have this, this in some sense is a row amplifier, and I'm going to have a, another row, but I'll connect them by the column. I'll have a column common ground. Okay, and sorry, this is kind of complicated. It gets very complicated very quickly. Um, but the end result is if, if that detector gets a click, sees a photon, you break the superconductivity, the current flows towards that amplifier instead, and there was current flowing through uh, the ground, so to speak, and now it's gone, so you see a dip in the current flow. So you get a signal in the row, a positive, some sense, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I've been transposed. You get a positive click now in the column here, and then a negative click in the row. And so the, you have to look for coincidences for, for signals in the column versus rows, and you can figure out what pixel uh, detected a photon. And so now we can do n squared pixels read out with two n readout lines. Uh, and each one of these circles represents a detector in series with an inductor. All right, so one of the things that's really great about this is that if you think back and about uh, where the state of the art was using niobium nitride, you know, I, draw, I drew this count rate versus critical current or bias current curve. Um, it never plateaued. So if you were going to try to do this multiplexing scheme, uh, when there would be leakage current, uh, a little bit of current that leaked over from a neighboring pixel would cause the, the current that did not see a photon to fire, and that's bad. So you'd have to back off on the bias so it could accommodate a little bit of leakage current. And that just reduced your detection efficiency. The beautiful thing is that with this, this plateau where the bias and the efficiency is that they're independent, it's flat, you get high efficiency independent of bias current, you can back off on the bias of a pixel, accommodate that little bit of leakage, and have this multiplexing scheme. So this plateau, this new material, really enabled this new kind of way of doing multiplexed readout. And so this is a picture, uh, an optical picture of the first time we tried to do this. Uh, Varun, who's the postdoc who, who made this, this is actually right there is the nanowire detector for them, a two by two array. And these are big inductors and resistors just to be sure that the multiplexing and the shunting of current worked correctly. And one of the things that happens these days is uh, cell phones are actually an amazing tool and now we're using them to record what's going on in the lab. Unfortunately, it doesn't go into the notebook, but at least there's some record. Whoops, oh, this, where's the video? 
Oh, I'm really sad. The video, here we go. And so here you can see the signals from the row and column. And if you're kind of lucky, you can kind of make out Varun. Here's his hand. There's the camera, his phone taking the video. But this is the 2x2 two two pixel working on the oscilloscope. OK, so one of the things we did pretty quickly and with the support of Mark here uh, was expand to 8x8. Eight eight. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show you some experiments we did here with the 8x8 eight eight detector array. Uh, if I blow up the 8x8 eight eight array, it's actually um, the pixels around 30x30. 30 30. A large area of the pixel is taken up by this series inductor to reduce the leakage current. Uh, but it's around a 25% fill factor. 30 by 30 is the uh, a pixel itself, photosensitive pixel, and then the rest of it's filled with the resistor and, the, and a series inductor. This is the kind of system we have at NIST to actually cool this thing down. This is way bigger than one actually needs, uh, but okay, we had it around. Uh, this is all the bias electronics. You literally just set the voltage on the arrays and it just works. Uh, and there's a little Raspberry Pi somewhere controlling the temperature of this thing. Uh, this is all the readout electronics that is recording the time of arrival uh, and that does the coincidences to figure out which pixel fired. Inside, we actually did a free space coupled array. So inside, in the cold area, we actually have some lenses. Uh, the array chip is sitting right here. There's a lens here. Uh, this is the standard Thor Labs cage mounting system. Turns out you can cool it off and it works fine. Cold. Uh, this is kind of an optical schematic of what it looks like. So our refrigerator gets down to 840 millikelvin. Uh, you just basically turn it on, hit a few buttons, and you can get to this temperature. Uh, we had to work really hard and think carefully about filtering the black body radiation because now it's, we're no longer using fiber. It turns out that fiber, uh, fiber was really nice to us when we made fiber coupled devices because it blocked all the, the photons. So the red curve is the photon flux as a function of wavelength from room temperature black body. And what was nice about fiber was it automatically blocked these wavelengths. You couldn't get wavelengths longer than about 1.8 microns through the fiber. And we only saw this many counts per second due to black body radiation. Now that we're doing free space coupling, everything can come in. We have to appropriately uh, find filters that we can install at the 4 Kelvin and 77 Kelvin stage to block the radiation longer than, let's say, 2 microns. So we came up with a set of filters that normally worked OK uh, to block the black body. And then this is an example of us focusing light. Here's the, here's the 1550 laser light. I, we moved it off the device because the device is trying to kind of optimize to detect the 1550. So when the laser light's on the device, you don't see it because it's absorbed all the light. So there's the laser spot off the device. And then we can move it around with optics outside and illuminate different pixels. Uh, and then this just is showing you that uh, all 8x8 eight eight pixels worked. Uh, we see this nice plateau. Dark count rates are on the order of a kilohertz, or background count rates, sorry, on the order of kilohertz. And basically, every time we make one of these arrays, uh, all the pixels work. There's no, there's no problem. Uh, in contrast, the, the best groups in the world using the, the nitride material that I talked about early on the probability of them yielding a single pixel is on the order of 30%. So when you think about 30% likely chance that they yield a single pixel and you take it to the 64th power, they, de they, don't, they can't make one of these arrays. The, the probability of them yielding is really small. Uh, so this is uh, yeah, showing that all 64 pixels work. This is an example of row and column pulses. And then this is a zoom in of this region here to, to show you the crosstalk that's leaking to the other pixels. And then we did some interesting demos. So this is a, uh, there's a, there's a collimated laser beam. It's focused onto a DMD and that gets imaged in through a periscope up into the bottom of the cryostat and hitting our detector. And there's the uh, digital light processing module from TI. And that's the picture of our array again. And then in real time, with all those, uh, that electronics that was hanging off there, we could basically scroll, uh, in some sense, a banner message uh, across the DMD and actually image it with our single photon detectors in real time. All right, so that's, that's work we've done recently. 
Um, let me talk about, with the remaining time, things that we would like to do or we're working on. Um, one of the big things that uh, I've been interested more recently on is really understanding uh, what are the tools and technology you, technologies that are needed to do quantum information processing with, with, uh, with single photons. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing there and trying to integrate uh, quantum optic sources with our single photon detectors. Um, turns out with these really high efficiency detectors that we, we make, uh, you can do something known as a Bell test. And so this is a, this is a foundational, I would say, physics experiment where uh, we're going to potentially rule out. And there was, a, there was actually an article in the New York Times that made the New York Times of an experiment that was done in Delft using nitrogen vacancy centers showing that the, showing they did a Bell test and showing that local realism couldn't explain the world. And we're about to try to verify that with our uh, superconducting nanowire detectors. Uh, that, you know, that, that quantum mechanics does explain the world we see and there isn't these funny loopholes or local realistic hidden variable theories that can explain the world. Uh, and that really relies on a uh, notion in quantum mechanics known as an entanglement. And we have this project with other people within NIST to try to use entanglement to make certifiable random numbers. Um, you know, recently I think the, the director of the CIA had his email hacked, right? It's, Cybersecurity and, and password things, that is just, it's a major headache. And uh, I carry around a little RSA token that uh, I have to type in the, those six digits, so six, whatever, six digit number if I want to check my email at NIST because this is the kind of multi layered security we need to do. It turns out that it might be possible to totally revamp the IT security and password system if different places around the world had certified random numbers. We might be able to do our whole cryptography uh, system different and very securely with uh, if we had trusted sources of random numbers. And we're trying to figure out whether that's possible using quantum resources. One of the fundamental tenets that, that uh, cryptographers have is you can't trust your source of random numbers. That's just, they just don't, you, that's just some, that's their fundamental, one of their fundamental assumptions. And we're hoping with our program uh, using our detectors and entanglement to to break that assumption and have people define new ways of doing cryptography. Uh, we've also been working on a quantum enigma machine, so a quantum version of the enigma machine using our multi-pixel array, uh, as well as trying to image in the near IR. Uh, I'll also try to talk a little bit about some remote sensing experiments we did, and I think there's some interesting applications there in greenhouse gas, and I'll probably end with, if I have time, an explanation of counting photons with optical power metrology, but I, I doubt I'll get to that. Um, so let me just quickly talk about these remaining few items. All right, so one of the things that people are really interested in is understanding how to move their optical table of all this kind of optics and lenses and mirrors and beam splitters onto a chip and using silicon photonics. So recently, uh, we're about to get a paper published where we've, we're doing that and actually we're doing quantum type experiments or generating entangled pairs or correlated photon pairs in the same fab line. So the same, same foundry that's making the chips that went into the Watson computer and the PlayStation 3 and 4, uh, we get a chip out of that, that uh, CMOS fab line and with the right kind of optical structures we're making through optical Fourier mixing, uh, we're making quantum states alight and uh, twin photon pairs. And on top of these kinds of structures, we're soon going to integrate our nanowire detectors and detect these photons. So sources, filters, and detectors are all going to be on one chip. Uh -huh. Anyway, that's, that's a little cartoon of the whole process. The other thing we're doing is we're trying to understand whether we can integrate uh, some of the things where people are looking at individual trapped ions here. This is a trapped ion. Uh, this is from the Dave Wineland group up in Boulder, Colorado. And with this single ion, they're able to do all kinds of, well, this and a chain of them, they're able to do all kinds of quantum information processing. But to check or to read out the quantum state of this trapped ion, they use, typically use a photomultiplier tube that's somewhere over here, room temperature, it's way off in the distance. Uh, what we'd like to do is integrate the detector, our meander detector that's going to detect that 313 nanometer photon directly right under the trapped ion. 
So we're talking about integrating on top of their four Kelvin trapped ion structure our, uh, our Molly germanium or our different, uh, well, a different kind of nanowire detector. Um, and uh, we made some nice progress. And here's an example of uh, a 115 nanometer line width detector made out of Molly silicon operating at 3.2 Kelvin. You see this nice bias plateau uh, and basically no dark counts. Uh, in, in the region where you're seeing photons. So the red is dark counts. Right at the critical current, you get an upshoot in dark counts, but practically there are no dark counts in, the, in this device. Um, oh, I guess I do have imaging in here. So one thing that we have done recently and we want to do is figure out how to expand um, the imaging capability of our single pixel as well as our 8x8 array. And, uh, like people here, we've been looking at uh, compressive imaging or compressive sensing, where you have an object, you go onto that digital micro mirror array, couple it to an array, or actually in this case a single pixel, and reconstruct the image of, of what you're trying to do. So in fact, instead of using a basketball or imaging a basketball, we imaged a light bulb. This is the light bulb we imaged. This is data taken um, with our single pixel nanowire detector took a very long time, two and a half hours, to effectively get a one megapixel by one megapixel image. Uh, but we're hoping with our 8 by 8 array and better signal processing techniques, uh, the time to take this kind of image would be much shorter. All right, and so maybe what I'll end, because it's getting kind of late, with is something I'm excited to buy. Uh, I don't know how much excitement other people will have, because uh, greenhouse gas monitoring may or may not be trendy in the near future, especially after the elections. Uh, but it's, um, it's to try to look at greenhouse gas and see if there's any kind of funny emissions occurring somewhere uh, that are unwanted, whether it's carbon dioxide or methane. And so one of the interesting things one can think about is doing dial at uh, 1.6 microns or so to look for, green, for, uh, for carbon dioxide. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. But the basic technique of, of dial is to use LIDAR. And what you do is you, you shoot light out, and you look at the back reflection. Uh, and you shoot on resonance of, let's say, an absorption line of CO2, and then slightly off. And so what you'll see is the, the amount of flux that you get back changes depending on how much CO2 was, uh, was there in your, in your path that the laser beam was in. Uh, and it's kind of like um, OTDR measurements in optical fiber, where you're trying to find, let's say, the broken fiber splice in, in your optical fiber. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, back reflection type measurement done on resonance and off resonance of, of whatever gas species you're looking at. So if, if you're on the resonance of the gas species, not much light gets back because it's getting absorbed. If you're off resonance, a lot comes back. So that ratio to on and off resonance lets you identify whether that gas is there. All right, so, so we didn't quite, we didn't do dial because we didn't have time to set up something that complicated. But what we did with people in Boulder was set up a laser where uh, the color that was emitted by the laser varied from pulse to pulse. So when the, so, and then it, it, it cycled through these colors and then went back and started again. So basically when the, uh, photon gets, oh, well, okay, so then what we're going to do is we're going to send that, let's say, comb of light to something far away. And in this case, we shot it off the mountains out the back windows of NIST, reflects off the mountains, and comes back to the detector. And what we can then, then do is probe the absorption in the column of light, actually the column of light uh, that's, in, uh, that's in these two black lines. And if this color is not absorbed, you'll get a very strong signal initially. If this one's absorbed, you'll see, very le you'll see less. And then, you know, so as a function of time and rep repetition, you can integrate, you can get uh, an absorption curve uh, for these different colors. All right, so that's what this is. This is a comparison of what conventional technology does today. So a $100,000 photomultiplier tube. This is what they use now. Uh, this is looking at the methane doublet absorption. And what you see here is, uh, as a function of color, it's, you know, it, it's, you're getting a lot of signal. Then you hit the methane absorption, it dips, goes down, comes back up, dips down, and goes back up. So it's really hard, actually, to see that doublet in this raw data. 
right? And then you have to do sophisticated uh, signal processing because you have to subtract this background. So your knowledge on that dip or your uncertainty on that dip actually isn't very good because you have a lot of background DC offset subtraction you have to do. So this is the raw data coming out of Fulger multiplier tube. Just swap in our detector, uh, and you can more easily see there's this doublet in the methane absorption. So we're pretty excited by this. We're hoping uh, people who want to do some atmospheric studies would be interested, and maybe we'll build a system uh, to do something like that in the future. All right, so let me just end here. I think uh, it's... I think actually superconductivity offers uh, devices that really have unmatched performance uh, compared to semiconducting devices. I think uh, our group and other groups around the world have really done some amazing work to improve the efficiency and actually scale up to arrays. I think there's now, because we can make arrays, a lot of interesting opportunities in communications and remote sensing. One of the things I want to emphasize is that people don't really know what the fundamental limits are in terms of these, these kinds of devices. That's just not known. Not enough research has gone into that. Um, packaging and cooling is still a risk, but that's active area of research we're trying to reduce. And one of the things that we're interested in is understanding you know, what kind of back-end signal processing can we start to integrate with our devices to really scale up to large area arrays. So uh, let me just end with, if you're interested, you should definitely think about coming up to to NIST in Boulder and, and doing a postdoc. Thank you.